Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Beyond the Scope discussion series. Um, today, we're going to have a little bit different of a talk. Um, we have uh, Professor Vicki Waisaki um, giving our talk today. She'll be talking about mass, native mass spectrometry and kind of how it relates to cryo-electron microscopy. Um, I just want to point out a couple upcoming topics. So next week we'll have a similar topic um, on the bio area where Bin Bin will be talking about cryo-electron tomography in the TEM. And then we'll be moving back to SEM um, with Tyler Grassman um, doing electron channeling contrast imaging in the SEM before going um, onto some other advanced TEM techniques with magnetic contrast um, with Norea. So for today's talk, uh, Vicky's going to be talking about the complementarity of native mass spec and cryo-electron microscopy and kind of how it's going to be important for structured biology and how these approaches can work together. Um, Vicky is in charge of the CCIC here as long as being a professor um, in the chemistry department. Um, the short, the question, um, the whole session is going to be probably 30, 40 minutes long, and then there should be lots of times for questions. So if you have any questions, um, if you put those in the Q&A, that'd be great. Um, or we can chat as well near the end. If you have any difficulties, let us know as well. Okay, Vicki, go ahead. Okay, uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, I am going to tell you about native mass spectrometry and give some examples where we have both cryo-EM data and native mass spectrometry data so that you can see how those uh, can sometimes work together or occasionally one of them works better, better than the other depending on the question we're trying to answer. If you're not familiar with the native mass spectrometry, it is uh, introducing typically protein samples or protein RNA, protein DNA samples into the mass spectrometer. These can be soluble or they can be membrane proteins that we introduce in nanodisks or micelles. And we can mass select a species that we're interested in. Uh, in my lab, we often collide the ions into a surface. And then we analyze them using a couple of different techniques. Uh, some of our mass spectrometers have something called ion mobility so that we can separate ions by their shape and charge. So it's a bit like a gas phase electrophoresis. And then we also, of course, measure their masses using mass spectrometry. We fragment um, often by using a technique like this surface collision. So I'll tell you about that. Um, if you're not familiar at all with native mass spectrometry, I wanted to put up this one slide that said you may be more familiar with approaches where maybe somebody does something to a molecule in solution, and then they might denature the protein, they might chop it up into pieces using enzymes and do something maybe like bottom-up proteomics to figure out these uh, modified peptides from a protein. But in the native approach, what we're trying to do is to keep the complex as native as possible, to keep it in its original 3D um, structure. And that may sound strange if you consider that we're spraying into the gas phase, we're coming out of solution, going into the gas phase. We can carry along some salt and some solvent. Um, but the other thing to remember is that these complexes are being held together by a lot of interactions at interfaces, and those take time to cleave or to rearrange. And so the mass spec experiment often is less than a second. The entire time in the mass spectrometer may be only in the 100 millisecond range. And so the complex is thought to often be kinetically trapped in its original solution structure as it travels through the mass spectrometer and we do different things to it. Of course, we may intentionally try to cleave interfaces and I'll show you some examples of that. And so we do use a technique to transfer these protein complexes into the gas phase. Uh, and like I said, they're often kinetically trapped. So we have our complex, it's being sprayed from solution with appropriate electrolytes here. We want to use volatile electrolytes so that they will leave as this droplet shrinks and as our uh, multi-protonated complex is produced. And then we get an electrospray mass spectrum. So the axis here is mass to charge and then 
the y-axis is intensity. This is an example of a protein complex, which is giving mainly a protein complex with 10 charges on it or 11 charges on it. Usually those charges are protons. And this particular case, just as an example, was run in um, ammonium acetate with a little bit of triethyl ammonium acetate. Those are volatile buffers that help us keep the right um, electrolyte balance, the, the, the concentration of salt that might be typical in, in a cellular system, but we're not using sodium chloride or other salts we're using in our, our volatile buffers. And many systems are very okay to be in those um, buffers instead of of something more like sodium chloride. You can look at very large complexes using these techniques. So things like these um, intact virus capsids, these are in the three and four megadalton range. Uh, people are looking at things as high as, you know, 60 to 80 megadaltons, depending on the type of detection that they use in the mass spectrometry. A lot of uh, the complexes we look at are smaller than that. We're not typically looking up in the megadalton range, although we have occasionally done that. Um, but one of the points I wanted to make is that we learned something from these mass spec charge state distributions beyond uh, just knowing that these things have sprayed and that they have a certain number of charges on them. I'm showing here an example of a protein that has a long disordered tail. So it's got an intrinsically disordered region not very well um, structured. And so that particular comp, uh, protein gives us two dominant charge states, but it gives us a broad range of other charge states because as this is released from the electrospray droplet, there are many different ways that you could charge this overall protein. If you clip away that uh, floppy tail, then we get a more rigid and more ordered complex or protein in this case, just a protein, and then uh, we have a much narrower charge state distribution. So we can learn something just even from just the simple electrospray mass spectrum. We can do all kinds of different things. I wanted to show you quickly just a couple of examples of just spraying some uh, systems into the mass spectrometer. This first one is a protein called uh, trap. This protein is an 11 merprotein complex. So here's a cartoon structure. And each one of those monomers can bind a tryptophan. This plays a role in regulating uh, tryptophan production biologically. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to titrate in tryptophan and we wanted to see if we could compare the actual experimental data to some models considering whether we would have this tryptophan binding under a strong positive cooperativity situation or under weak positive cooperativity, for example. And we see that the weak positive cooperativity is a much better match to the experimental data than uh, this strong positive cooperativity model. And so uh, these are fairly quick experiments to do uh, once you have nice clean protein that you know how to handle. Like with any technique, uh, you have to know your, your biological system well, you have to be able to prepare a reasonable quality protein. And if you've never done this, of course, then you have to learn how to, to use the mass spectrometer. Um, for that particular case, we were interested in whether there's a difference in tryptophan loading or propensity to load um, when there's no RNA present in the complex or when the complex is wrapped with RNA and we see a very different behavior for the protein RNA complex compared to the protein alone complex, um, much uh, greater fraction bound of the tryptophan loading when the RNA is present. And so just a couple of simple examples to show you, just spraying in native mass spec electrospray, we get good information that we can acquire relatively quickly. Um, and, and maybe an example that would surprise you, this is just to introduce you to that ion mobility technique. This is a case that we did with uh, Zukai Suo's group a few years ago. They were using FRET to look at the closed and open form of a complex that is a trimer. So three proteins um, in this trimer arrangement. And they 
we're looking at the fact that this thing can be either in this open state or in this closed state and that that varied as they changed the salt concentrations. So they're using here different concentrations of salt and they're watching the ratio of this open on the left to the closed form on the right as a function of the salt. If you think, well, how could I do that in a mass spectrometer? Uh, we can actually, we just need to use that ion mobility technique that I told you about. So the gas phase approach that we use in our mass spectrometer is, is ion mobility. And I'm not going into detail of telling you how that works other than to tell you that it's a region with an electric field and with um, a bath gas that the ions flow through so that something that's more extended will take longer um, to travel than something that's more compact. And so we also changed the salt concentration, but in this case we used volatile salt. And we could also watch the ratio of the closed and the open form change as a function of salt concentration. So there's quite a lot that can be done with these uh, protein complexes in the gas phase. If we're spraying them out of solution, we can learn a lot about them. Often we need to fragment them. So we may want to use a technique called MSMS, where we have two stages of mass analysis. And so we'll isolate a complex that's of interest to us with the first stage of mass analysis, and then we'll activate in some way to cause dissociation, and then use the second mass analyzer to look at the products. One of the common ways to do this in commercial mass spectrometers is using gas collisions, collision-induced dissociation, CID, which means you collide your protein complex into a gas. You are increasing its kinetic energy to collide into this gas to cause it to vibrate more vigorously, like you saw in that little movie at the beginning of uh, my first slide, and then um, looking at the fragments. The problem with doing CID on protein complexes is that you often restructure, you often refold, unfold the protein complex, or at least one of the monomers of the protein complex. So in my group, we prefer to fragment into a surface. So this is a technique that um, we did not invent, but we've developed it for uh, use with these large protein complexes. If you think about colliding a protein complex or a protein RNA or protein DNA complex into a surface, the surface will always be more massive than the complex. So you can put a lot of energy in with a single hit. Unlike the gas, which is always smaller than the protein complex, we typically are using uh, inert gases, argon, for example. The complex is much larger than the gas, so each collision only transfers a tiny amount of energy into the complex. And that's why we get this restructuring process instead of this coming apart process. What we really hope to get is subunit connectivity of the complex. So I would say mass spectrometrists think about structure differently from people who do cryo-EM. We are not expecting to get atomic resolution from our data, but we are expecting to get useful information. And so if I show you two different dim um, tetramers here, this is a tetramer like streptavidin, which is a known dimer of dimers type structure shown as a cartoon form. And this is an alpha, beta, beta, alpha type uh, structure. So each of these tetramers can be mass selected in a tandem mass spectrometer and then collided into a surface in our surface induced dissociation approach. And the one that's a dimer of dimers will give us dimer products. That's great because we learn the connectivity. If this is an unknown structure, we've learned that this tetramer is a dimer of dimers. For the one on the bottom, the weaker interface is actually the alpha-beta interface instead of um, the beta-beta. And so uh, for this one, we get a monomer and a trimer. CID for both of these, the gas collisions, would have given us monomer trimer in both cases. And so I'm going to show you three different examples, like I said, where we have both native mass spec data and we have cryo-EM data. In this first case, uh, toicomycin nitrile hydratase. This was an enzyme that was given to us by a colleague when I was at University of Arizona. 
He did not know the stoichiometry of the complex, but he had a mass spec of his own in his biochemistry research group uh, where they could do denaturing mass spec. And he knew that he had three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit of this protein. But he didn't know how those assembled. He didn't know how many of each, and he didn't know how they were connected to each other. So we took that and sprayed it, and it was very clear from the electrospray spectrum that we had a hexamer. And that hexamer, based on mass, had two copies of alpha, two copies of beta, and two copies of gamma. We could isolate one of the charged states using our first mass analyzer in a tandem mass spectrometer. So we isolate the hexamer with 17 charges. We activate it by our gas collisions, our surface collisions. We usually do both. Um, because each of us, each of them can tell us some information. And then we are trying to figure out based on the fragments, how are these subunits connected to each other? And so we took that, as I said, 17 plus TNH unknown. So it's a hexamer, but we don't know its structure. It's about 80,000 Daltons altogether. So it's large to get total structural information from NMR. It hasn't been crystallized in spite of many efforts to crystallize it, no crystals. And it is uh, difficult for cryo-EM, and I'll show you that at the end of uh, the mass spec data. 80K, you know, we thought maybe 80K would be okay, but it turned out that it, that it wasn't. Um, so here are the gas collision results. So we've got that 17 plus hexamer, and it's fragmenting to give us some highly charged monomers and some corresponding pentamers. So that confirms that we do have the hexamer that we think we have. Um, but then we collide into the surface. So this is the surface-induced association taking that hexamer with 17 charges. And these are product ions that are being produced. And the dominant products at this particular energy, uh, so we've set a voltage difference between where the ions are formed and where they collide with the surface of 50 volts because we have our 17 charges on there, we get um, an 850 electron volt collision. And we break that hexamer into two trimers. The hexamer had 17 total protons on it. And so each trimer, uh, one has eight protons and the other one has nine protons. Eight plus nine equals 17. So we've got good charge conservation. And based on mass to charge, we can tell you that each one of those trimers has one copy of alpha, one copy of beta, and one copy of gamma in this complex. So that's great. And that's the first bit of structural information we had on this complex after knowing that it's a hexamer. We now know that this hexamer is two trimers, each one with an alpha, a beta, and a gamma. At that uh, first study, we didn't yet have this ion mobility technique in our lab, but as soon as we did, we tried this complex. So we select the ion of interest, uh, for example, with a quadrupole, we collide into our surface, and then we let the products separate themselves using this ion mobility cell, where we have gas present. Think of it as your gas phase electrophoresis, sorting the ions by their shape and their charge. And um, then we'll look at the products with our next stage of mass anal analysis, which is a tunnel flight in this um, particular instrument. And so the plots that we get from that ion mobility experiment have a mass to charge axis because we've measured their mass to charge, but they also have a drift time axis because we've measured how long it takes them to drift through that pressurized cell in the presence of an electric field. And so you get this nice plot of all of the different products that are produced. I showed it to you as a mass spectrum previously. Here I'm showing it to you as this thing called a mobilogram because a mobilogram can tell us, um, sort of help us separate out all of these different products. It also gives us information on the actual collision cross sections, the rotationally average um, collision cross section. Think of it as sort of the shadow size of the, each of the pieces. And so we see those trimers that I told you about. This is a higher energy than what I showed you, and we have a lot of other products being formed. So we don't just have the trimers, we also have some tetramers, and the tetramer has an alpha, a beta, and two gammas. The dimer that corresponds to that um, tetramer has an alpha and a beta. 
and so on. So we have all these different pieces and the only way we could really put these pieces together is in the connectivity shown here. We knew we had two trimers and the data here confirmed that and all of these different pieces that we could measure suggest that we have the connectivity shown here. The first trimer is connected to the second trimer through a beta-beta interface and a gamma-gamma interface. And the lines are shown heavier or lighter here. Depending on how much abundance we have in this mobilogram, how likely was it to cleave those particular bonds? And um, that actually turned out, as we got more information on this complex, to be a pretty good representation of the relative interface areas in, these, um, in this overall complex. So now we know that it's a hexamer, we know that it's two trimers, we know that those trimers are um, bound through a beta-beta and a gamma-gamma interface. We did several other things because this was one of the uh, first complexes that where we were trying to work on this as a total unknown. Um, and we, we used our surface collision data and our ion mobility separation to give us the connectivity. We did some coarse grain modeling. Uh, we did some homology modeling using some tetrameric nitrile hydratases from the literature and, and working with those to come up with a structure for the hexamer. Um, we did labeling of exposed residues uh, to try to reconfirm the interface here. We knew that we didn't have pieces from alpha interacting from pieces with alpha. That was consistent with the overall structure. And finally, at the request of a reviewer, we also did some chemical cross-linking to validate that what we thought were interacting regions were interacting regions. And so this was published. Um, so there is still no uh, published uh, X-ray structure, there's no published cryo-EM, but at one point, uh, right after Thermo had purchased FEI, they came to us and said, do you have a complex or two where we could provide cryo-electron microscopy data to compare back to show the synergy between native mass spec and cryo-EM? And this, of course, was one complex where I wanted that information. And uh, we discussed it being 80K and we said, okay, uh, we know that people are starting to see things in these smaller ranges, so let's give it a try. And so Thermo attempted this and they spent about 18 months on this. They, um, they used, I think in the end, five different instruments, uh, both Glacios and Tria, um, uh, <laughs> my um, mouth isn't working, but they, um, Creos instruments, they, they did this multiple ways. They did it with face plates, they did it without face plates. And finally they talked to me and they said, could you send us your structures that you predicted based on your modeling and your mass spectrometry? And we will try to fit those into these envelopes that we're getting. They were getting no better than 20 angstrom resolution. Their conclusion was that this complex is moving in the ice when they irradiate it and that until the software can correct for this motion, they will not do better than this. So they um, to basically told me to stop calling to see if they had new results because they don't think they can improve it at this point. And they felt like our two lowest energy structures that we had predicted were fitting pretty well to their um, shapes that they were getting out of this uh, result that they could get. The next one uh, that I want to show you is one that's currently submitted for publication. This is a fairly new one. This is a study that um, was done by one of my former students who actually came back and did some work here to get the mass spec data because at Pacific Northwest National Lab, they don't have this uh, surface induced dissociation technique. I didn't mention that's not yet commercially available. We're working to put it in the instruments of multiple vendors. Um, but it's not yet commercially available. So this student came, a former student came back to, to do this work. And actually he had, uh, um, did the results for two of the, the next two examples that I'll show you. And then a student in my group took over. He could only stay for a couple of days. And then um, Chen Du did a, a lot of the additional work along with Zach Van Merriman. This one was an interesting case because they had a lot of, of very good quality cryo-EM data, but the mass specs still played a role. And Moe put these uh, slides together for a talk he gave. So the slides I'll show you uh, were put together by him for a talk he gave recently. Um, and I modified them just slightly. 
And the, the system that um, we're interested in is as an enzyme, pseudoenzyme complex that's important in vitamin B6 biosynthesis. And uh, the enzyme PDX1.3 is the active enzyme. PDX1.2 is a pseudoenzyme. Um, inactive by itself, but known to be essential. Um, it's expressed under stress, and they know that it modulates the activity of PDX1.3, but they weren't quite sure how. And so um, the sequences have a lot of identity and homology, and they know that 1.2 somehow positively regulates the 1.3, but the mechanism is not known. It, uh, the 1.2 resists crystallization, although 1.3 has been crystallized. And so what they wanted to do was to look at these um, but with cryo-EM, both as the single protein form and as the mixed protein form. So this is a 12-mer of the pseudoenzyme, a 12-mer of the active enzyme. They are both dodecamers. Um, and what they did was to go in and um, produce these with self-free expression so that they can make them in mixed uh, forms where they have a mixture of PDX1 and, and PDX, I mean, sorry, 1.2 and 1.3. What has been proposed by people in this field is that these are probably forming complexes and undergoing subunit exchange by changing out entire hexamers as shown in this little cartoon. They did self-re-expression so that they can make this in varying ratios um, all the way from 12 to zero to zero to 12. And they um, could show by a gel that they were definitely getting production of, of both forms of the enzyme. That's a denaturing gel. And then on the native gel, they could show that in the co-expression system, they were producing these mixed enzyme pseudoenzyme complexes, but if they just um, physically mixed those together, they could not produce those uh, intermediate forms. So these are just some mass spectra to show you that they were making what they thought they were making. So they could make the 1.2 as a dodecamer, they could make the 1.3 as a dodecamer. These are just uh, mass spectra deconvoluted uh, for charts to show you a mass axis. So this complex is in the 450 kilodalton range. Um, so 12 to zero, zero to 12, and then a lot of mixtures in between. So they could actually end up making every version of this complex from, from 12 copies of the 1.3 all the way up to 12 copies of the 1.2 and everything in between. And this hypothesis, uh, just the quick mass spec show that their hypothesis that this was always mixing six to six is not correct because we're seeing a whole lot of intermediate forms. And then the question is, how are all these intermediate forms mixing? Are they mixing more symmetrically, less symmetrically? Um, what are they actually doing? So we need tandem mass spectrometry for that. Um, you might ask, what about the cryo-EM? Well, they were able to get uh, cryo-EM data on the uh, 1.2 and the hetero complex structures. They solved those to 3.2 angstroms. But they found that they could not, within those structures, even at 3.2 angstroms, differentiate between the 1.2 and the 1.3 because the 1.2 pseudoenzyme and the 1.3 enzyme are very similar in structure. So when they have the mixed forms, they couldn't actually tell which copy was a 1.2 and which copy was a 1.3. So that's when we use the native mass spectrometry, tandem mass spectrometry experiment. So we spray these in with electrospray. We can select one uh, arrangement, one uh, ratio of 1.2 to 1.3 at a time, fragment those by colliding into a surface, and then measure those. In this case, we're using an Orbitrap analyzer. And what we found 
um, as the interesting result, when you take this 12 mer, which is six copies of 1.2, six copies of 1.3, and you fragment it, six mer is the dominant product, although there are other products, of course, six mer is dominant. So coming apart to two, uh, six rings, we think, um, we need to do ion mobility to confirm that these are cleaving ring ring instead of also perhaps getting some uh, cleavage through the rings. But uh, for now, we're assuming ring ring. And what we found with this six mer, imagine how these things might be mixing that we should learn when we get our six mer. Our six mer was predominantly three copies of 1.2, three copies of 1.3. So, so if these are cleaving through the wing, there's no way that this um, is explained as a 3-3 mix unless these are mixing within each hexamer. We also looked, of course, at the different ones. I'm not going to show you each one of them, but this is showing you the 7-5 mix. So seven copies of pseudoenzyme, five copies of enzyme. We fragment it to get the 6-mer. And this particular 6-mer can't be 3-3 three, because three, we started with 7-5. So uh, one ring could have three copies of 1.2 and three copies of 1.3. But if one ring has 3-3, three, three, then the other one needs to be 4-2. And so when we um, look at this 6-mer, the blow up so that you can see the peaks more clearly, we had as the two 6-mers coming from one 12-mer we have one that's 3-3 three, three, and the other is 4-2. And so we're learning quite a lot about this structure using the native mass spectrometry, um, coupling the data with the, the cryo-EM. We actually have uh, looked at fragmentation and we're going to continue doing a little more um, fragmentation on all of the possible mixtures so that we can really get a good handle on how these things are, are mixing during the expression. Um, but we're very clearly able to rule out um, what the community had previously thought. Uh, we definitely do not have six ring, six ring of the 1.2, 1.3. We have intermixing of the 1.2 and the 1.3 in the structure. So as we go through a little bit more data, we'll, we'll get a little more information on that. Um, oops. And I just wanted to mention, if you're interested in, in looking at that in more detail, it is on BioArchive. And so you can, um, can look this paper up. It's been submitted. Um, and so you can read the most recent version on BioArchive. The other one that I'd like to tell you where we also have some cryo-EM data is uh, this multi-copper, uh, sorry, it's a manganese oxidizing multi-copper oxidase. This is um, another one that came to us by way of Pacific Northwest National Lab. It came originally from Oregon Health Sciences University from Bradley Tebow's group, working with Christine Romano, and they had sent it to PNNL to get ultra high resolution mass spec data. But in this case, mass spec data alone don't solve the problem because this is a very heterogeneous complex. Each ligand, can contain different numbers of copper. Um, they didn't know even how many copies of the different subunits are present. They could denature and they could learn that they have a small subunit called minx E, a small subunit named minx F, and a large subunit named minx G. But without knowing how many of each of these and how many coppers, even the original native mass spec didn't answer the question. We really need to cause fragmentation to figure out the structure. There was a lot going on here. There were some post-translational modifications. There was some incomplete desolvation and so on. So um, this was sent to us and uh, one of my students at the time, Stella Song, took this and she fragmented it. Using the gas collisions, we get the E and F monomers, as you would expect. When we do the surface-induced dissociation, we see the big minx G subunit coming off and we see a hexamer that's made up of the E and F subunits. And as we take the SID energy higher, we see that that hexamer falls apart to give us pentamer, tetramer, trimer, dimer, monomer. 
if we had been brand new to this kind of fragmentation, we might not have understood that, but we've done a lot of uh, complexes. And so when we see everything from the NMR down to the one-mer, um, we typically think that we may be working with a cyclic component in the complex. Because you can imagine if you have a cyclic uh, component, then if you cleave any two interfaces, which you need to do to get unique fragments, when you fragment this and uh, cleave these two adjacent interfaces, for example, you would get a monomer and a pentamer. When you cleave two uh, non-adjacent interfaces like this, you would get a dimer and a tetramer. And when you cleave through the middle, uh, you would get um, a trimer and a trimer. And of course, we also have, in addition to this drift time information, we have the mass axis here. So we know the mass of all of these products. And the masses of the dimers always showed us that we had an E and an F. If we had a trimer as a product, we had two E's and an F and two F's and an E. The tetramer had two of each and so on so that we are proposing that this is probably EF, 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 arranged in a ring-like structure and then bound to the minx uh, G, the big subunit, non-covalently. Um, Cryo-EM had not been done at the time we published the paper, so we published um, our data with the native mass spec and some other techniques. And then after that, Bradley Thibault sent this to Stanford to try to get cryo-EM. And we're very grateful to Megan Meyer, who did those experiments. Um, and they worked on it. And uh, these are some of the images they sent back to us. We were very pleased after, predi pre after um, predicting that there was this ring-like structure to see ring-like structures in some of these images. But at this point, Stanford said, this one is too difficult. It's too heterogeneous. We're giving it back to you. Oregon Health Sciences University needs to figure out how to do this if they want to continue to work on this. So again, this is a case where the cryonium is a challenge, but we have some mass spec data that let us make, make progress in spite of that, and which might help us uh, to interpret the cryonium data. So I did want to put up a slide uh, that was provided to me by uh, Thermo, uh, Rosa Viner uh, from Thermo and Albert K, I'll call him, from Thermo came here and gave a talk a um, couple of years ago and they had this slide and I asked for a copy of it because it's a great slide for making the case that with cryo-EM and native mass spec, there is a lot of synergy. And one of the big areas where people should use the native mass spec is when they're doing the initial biochemistry and trying to get a pure sample that they would want to eventually run by cryo-EM, where they want to check their stability and their concentration, where they want to look at maybe some different conditions and whether they're getting the same oligomeric state and so on. If they're looking at mutants, and perhaps trying to compare the oligomeric state of the mutant and the original form. It's great to use native mass spec in those studies because it's a very fast um, experiment and can give you a lot of information to compare with some of your other information like your gel or your analytical ultracentrifugation and your negative staining and so on. And then the other area where we and Thermo believe that we'll be able to also help is in 3D reconstruction. So as the software for 3D reconstruction improves, can we use that um, native mass spec data, especially the fragmentation data that tells us how subunits are connected to each other, that tells us perhaps uh, the nature of a ligand that's bound, maybe that ligand isn't showing up in the cryo structure, maybe there's a lipid that's not resolved, for example, and the native mass spec can knock that off and give us a mass and a number of unsaturations and so on. So um, we're also doing some work here at OSU with Stefan Linder from Chemistry Biochemistry, who is helping us to use some of the, what I would call a lower resolution structural data from the native mass spec with some intermediate resolution um, experiments by SACS or by cryo-EM and so on um, to bring that together and get higher resolution than we would have been able to with just one technique alone. 
So um, I want to finish by saying we are funded um, here at Ohio State, uh, my lab working with some other labs at Ohio State and with a lab at uh, a couple of labs at Texas A&M and West Virginia University. We are funded as an NIH biomedical technology research resource uh, to develop native mass spectrometry to guide structural biology studies. These uh, centers, if you're not familiar with the P41 mechanism, they are technology development centers that are driven by biomedical projects. So at the time of proposal, you propose the biomedical projects that you work on and, and how technology is driven by those projects. We also do a lot of collaboration and service, training and dissemination, which are also core missions of um, a P41 center. So we're happy to help people out if they have questions that we could help answer um, by the native mass spectrometry, or if you just wanna learn more about it, uh, we can help help you learn what you can do with the native mass spectrometry. And I'd like to stop there and acknowledge um, lots of people. NSF has funded a lot of our instrument development work, NIH um, now funding that through this center grant. Lots of uh, software collaborators uh, who are helping us tremendously to interpret those spectra automated in an automated way lots of vendors um, providing information so that we can put devices in their instruments, lots of separation uh, companies working with us because we're trying to automate everything, all of the steps of this experiment. We're starting to build up some um, biopharma collaborators um, who are working with us. We've added recently um, Johnson & Johnson and um, a couple of the students, three of the students actually from my group have recently gone to Merck where they'll be doing more of the native mass spec. Um, and then we're very dependent on huge numbers of protein and RNA and DNA collaborators who give us beautiful samples to work with. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Cool, thanks Vicki for the great talk. I enjoyed it. Um, if anyone has questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A and we'll start answering those. Yeah, I see one in the uh, Q&A that says, uh, I'd like to know whether native mass spec is able to tell the structure of complexes other than protein, for example, starch lipid uh, complex. How did you determine the structure of the fragment or the monomers? Uh, structure of fragment monomers or polymers. Okay, so um, I'll start with the first question. Can we do things other than proteins? So we've done a lot of RNA, we've done some DNA, um, we're getting ready to try some DNA origami, uh, for example. We've done lots of RNA uh, protein complexes, DNA protein complexes, RNA, RNA complexes. We, ha we have also been working on membrane proteins bound to lipids, and um, we've looked at intact nanodisks and nanodisks filled with proteins and, and um, peptides. And so those kinds of things we're very comfortable doing. We have not looked at starch lipid complexes. That doesn't mean we couldn't. Um, one thing that's important to us is how heterogeneous is a sample, because if there are a lot of, um, if there's a lot of structural heterogeneity, all of the charge state distributions start to overlap in the spectrum. I don't think I have a good example of that in this particular presentation. Um, but I, you know, I, I tend to never say never. It's one of those things where we would have to try to see what it would look like um, and, and see if we could give some information on that. So contact us. Uh, we have on our website, if I'll go back and stay on that last slide or next to last slide. Um, if you go to, oops, and I don't have it on here, so nativems.osu.edu, if you just go to our website, there's a place where you can propose a collaboration, or you can just email me and I'll send you that link, um, and then we will uh, tell you what we can try for a particular kind of complex. How do we determine the structure of the fragment monomers or polymers produced by the SID or CID collisions? So um, if we're working with uh, a total unknown, and let's say it's a protein complex, and we don't know anything about it, we don't even know the sequence of the monomers, we might just denature and measure the mass of the intact monomers. 
And we might then also digest those monomers to do the um, sequence identification of those, um, in addition to doing the native mass spec where we knock the whole thing apart. So with the native mass spec, we're going from full complex to subcomplex. We're working on some instrumentation where we have another stage of fragmentation so that we can go from complex to subcomplex or monomer and then covalently fragment those pieces. That is not a fully functioning uh, routine method yet. So at the moment we do them as separate steps and then use the data together. <laughs>